Good afternoon. My name is Ellen Jane Moss, and I'm delighted to welcome those of you back who joined us previously for the Mount Sinai Institute for Exposomic uh, Research lunchtime, lunchtime Chat Series. For those of you who are new, welcome. I encourage everyone to check out the videos on the Institute website from the previous conversations. Dr. Sarah Evans gave a, fabulous, gave a fantastic introduction to this series, offering guidance on the easy things we can all do to protect ourselves. Last week, Dr. Meta Galvez emphasized the critical role we all must play to drive change in our communities. And I quote Dr. Galvez, home should be a refuge for families. And today's talk will put us on a path to make good on that idea. Dr. Zajac and Dr. Thanik will discuss common asthma triggers found in the home environment and share evidence-based tips for improving indoor air quality geared at creating healthier homes for families. Today's presentation will be about 25 minutes followed by 20 minutes for Q&A. I encourage you to submit your questions using the Q&A functions specific if it is, and be specific as if it is for Dr. Sajak or Dr. Thanik. And if we can't get to them all, we will work to get answers shared on social media using the hashtag environmental chats. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Dr. Lauren Zajak and Dr. Aaron Thanik are both assistant professors in the Department of Environmental Medicine and Public Health and the Department of Pediatrics. They lead the environmental pediatric program at Mount Sinai that, teach children, that treats children with known and suspected environmental exposures. And with that, please take the stage. Thank you very much, Ellen Jane. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to share, how does that look? All good? Okay. So I really appreciate the invitation to speak to you today, along with my colleague, Dr. Erin Thanek. And today we're going to talk about indoor air quality. Um, we're going to provide a, a bird's eye view of a topic that is very diverse and very comprehensive. And really indoor air quality is at the top of the list for our environmental health team in terms of priorities for children's environmental health. And while everything we talk about today, all the topics could be its own lecture in their own right, uh, we only have time today to provide a, some simple key steps that you can do in your home to improve indoor air quality. And why is indoor air quality at the top of our list? Well, we spend most of our time indoors and ever since the COVID-19 pandemic started, we've been spending even more time indoors. And that includes our homes, our schools, workplaces, and pollutants get trapped inside. And levels of pollutants inside homes and schools and workplaces can be two to five times higher than the levels of pollutants in outdoor air. And many pollutants that are asthma triggers are generated inside. And as you can see in the, the photo below, the middle airway is an airway of a child with asthma. As you can see, it's inflamed. And these airways are very sensitive to various types of indoor air pollutants. And that's why it's so important for children with asthma, as well as all of us, um, to improve the quality of indoor air. And really centered in indoor air quality is the condition of the, of the housing. And what we see here in our city um, is that areas that have high poverty rates have more housing quality issues, such as pests and mold and maintenance defects. And these same areas also have the highest burden of childhood asthma rates, as well as using uh, the emergency room for asthma attacks among children. And so our environmental asthma program, which Dr. Thanik will talk more about later, 
was launched to work with families and to work with a child's health care providers, whether that's a primary care pediatrician, their allergist, their pulmonologist, to reduce asthma triggers in the homes of children with asthma. And so why, um, why are indoor environments, uh, why can they get so polluted? And if you think about very broad categories, it could be due to human activities like smoking. It could be due to burning of fuel indoors, the products that we use, um, the condition of our home, and also how optimal the ventilation is. And for us New Yorkers, most of us are living in multi-unit housing, so apartment buildings, condos. And so we share air with our neighbors. And so um, what a neighbor is doing can actually impact your own indoor air quality. Further, New York City housing stock tends to be older. There could be maintenance issues like holes and cracks, leaky pipes. And what we've seen over the past year is that there have been delays in tenants getting these necessary uh, repairs due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so if you don't remember anything else from today's talk, remember this slide, because these are the three key principles of um, improving indoor air quality. So ventilate your home, and we'll be talking about each one of these throughout the lecture. So ventilation, routine maintenance and dust control, and reduce the sources of pollutants. So ventilation has been in the news a lot lately, but in context of COVID. And what ventilation is, is just air circulation and mixing in a building. And that typically happens in New York City apartments through two mechanisms. One is natural ventilation, and that's the pr probably the dominant mechanism of ventilation in many of our apartments. So natural ventilation really depends on opening windows and doors in order to get outdoor air in and let indoor air out, because remember pollutants build up inside. Buildings also have components of mechanical ventilation, which is forcing air in and out in order to achieve um, that mixture and dilution of indoor air. So the first thing to think about is your ventilation system and what does your home or your apartment building use for ventilation? And so some simple steps to take away. Windows are your friend. And so if you have operable windows, open them periodically um, to get an airflow throughout, throughout your home. Um, even in New York City, you might think, oh, you know, there's a lot of traffic. I'm worried about outdoor air pollutants. But believe it or not, it's still really important to open your windows regularly. Um, you know, I myself live by the George Washington Bridge, which is full of traffic, but I even make it a priority. I'm always opening my, my windows, realizing that things build up inside. The other things you could think about kind of room dependent. So in the kitchen, when you're using a stove, um, when you're using your oven, if you do have an exhaust hood, make sure it's on. If you don't, which many of us don't, in apartments, open your window, crack the window open when you're cooking. Uh, bathrooms are an, um, an very important to consider ventilation as you know, use of the bath and the shower can increase humidity. And so if you have a window, open it. If you don't, um, many of us in apartments, you might notice on your ceiling or on a wall, a little great that looks like this icon that I have on, on the slide. And that should be pulling air out. To make sure it's working, when you go home today, um, take a tissue or a piece of toilet paper and hold it up to that vent and see if it sticks. If it sticks, that means it's working. If you live in a home with um, a, a mechanical HVAC system, make sure you're having it inspected regularly and it's well maintained. Okay. 
Moving on to home maintenance. So, you know, it's important to identify and repair issues that could lead to problems like mold or pests or other indoor air quality concerns. So, for example, having cracks and holes repaired and sealed, addressing water leaks promptly. And for those of us who are renters in New York City, there are resources available to help facilitate getting that done. And so if you're a renter in the city, you can report maintenance complaints through the 311 system. Also in New York City, we have a, a new uh, local law, Local Law 55 of 2018, or the Asthma Free Housing Act, which lays out what landlords must do to address underlying maintenance issues that lead to asthma triggers, including pests and mold. Okay. The next key step, dust control. So household dust is made up of a lot of different things, um, including some chemicals and allergens, which could impact the health of people living in the home. And so just some simple steps, and this is what I do um, in my home, is I use uh, wet dusting and wet mopping regularly. So that just means using a damp cloth or a damp mop to clean solid surfaces in the home, because if you just use, say, a, a regular broom or a dry duster, it could just resuspend the dust in the air instead of removing it. The other thing is, is just having everybody take off their shoes before coming in your home and wash your hands, especially before eating. And for many reasons, infection control, but also to reduce exposure to chemicals and allergens in the dust. Okay, so specifically with asthma, um, we're going to talk today about two very broad categories of asthma triggers. One are respiratory tract irritants, and then Dr. Thanik's going to talk about allergens. And again, just a very uh, bird's eye view, and we'll provide you with a list of curated resources at the end that we'll send out. Okay, so smoke incursions. The, for those of us who live in multi-unit housing, apartment buildings, this situation can unfortunately be all too common. So remember how I mentioned before, apartments, condos, we, these units within a building share almost 65% of the air. So if your neighbor say is smoking cigarettes, that smoke can drift. So under doors, through ventilation systems, even through elect electrical outlets, any cracks and gaps between you know, floors and walls, around pipes. And so therefore tobacco smoke, which is an asthma trigger, as well as linked to many other health impacts can end up in your own home, even if no one is smoking in your own home. And so what can you do? Um, while the best solution is for the building to be completely smoke free, and we at the end provide resources on how to advocate for your own building becoming smoke free, there are steps you could take in the interim. And so what I've done in my apartment is you have to identify where the smoke's coming from. So in my case, it was um, under and around our front door. I've worked with families that it, the smoke was coming in um, around the pipes in the bathroom. So you have to identify the entry point and try to seal it up to the best of your ability. Also, ventilate. So ventilation is very, very important. Um, and then depending on the neighbor, and if you do have a relationship with the neighbor, talking to the neighbor about sealing their apartment as well, or having them smoke in a different area or outside, but that could be a little trickier. Um, gas stoves. So when most of us in the city use gas for cooking, and when this gas is burned, it releases something called nitrogen dioxide, which is an asthma trigger. And so it's really important when you're cooking to use that uh, exhaust hood. If it's not available, open your window and ventilate. Um, and just also a, a reminder that make sure you have working carbon monoxide and smoke alarms. 
near every sleeping area in the home because anytime you're burning or combusting fuel inside, that's one, a fire risk, but two, carbon monoxide. And uh, going further from that, but other sources of combustion like candles, incense, fireplaces, all can impact uh, indoor air quality with the many things that can trigger asthma, like soot, um, volatile organic compounds, um, nitrogen dioxide, et cetera. So it's, you know, we recommend to minimize combustion and when you are using combustion, for example, to cook, to make sure the home is well ventilated. The final thing I wanna mention are volatile organic compounds. So this is a term um, also known as VOCs. It, it encompasses a whole big range of organic chemicals and they get their name because they volatize or they off gas at room temperature and normal pressure. And so there are thousands of VOCs out there I've listed a few in here, but you could think broadly, you know, categories are products actively used in the home, um, products that are brought into the home, like furnishings that could have been produced using certain volatile organic compounds, as well as smoking. And so I'm going to wrap up my section with some some simple steps for VOCs. And again, we have a lot more information on this on our website, but no big surprise, ventilate. That helps uh, reduce levels of VOCs in your home. Also, when you're thinking about purchasing something, so furnishings, uh, paint, if you wanted to you know, paint a room in your home, as much as possible, choose products that have low or no VOCs. You also want to avoid air fresheners and fragrances because these can contain VOCs, and other chemicals that can be irritating to the respiratory tract. Um, and finally, things like avoiding dry cleaning. So when possible, um, not to use chemical dry cleaning, but if you do, um, because the garment has to be dry cleaned, try to air it out as much as you can before bringing it back into your home. And then finally, I just wanted to point out that on our website, um, we have a lot of information about safer cleaning. So there's a lot of cleaning chemicals that can be um, potentially harmful to children with asthma. And so thinking about the products that you're using, um, make your own uh, cleaning products when possible. So those are cheaper and they uh, are safer and shopping smart and picking um, products that are known to have less irritating chemicals. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Thanik. Thanks, Lauren. So I'm going to switch gears and talk about the relationship between common allergens and asthma and how you can decrease exposure to them in the home. And allergens are differentiated from the pollutants and irritants that Dr. Zajac just talked about because they drive inflammation by stimulating the immune system. But the end result is the same in that they also can cause an increase in asthma symptoms. And there are many allergens that have been linked to asthma, but I'm going to focus on the common allergens that are found indoors, including mold, cockroach, dust mite, and pets. So I'm going to start with mold. Um, there's a strong relationship between housing and mold because there are many building characteristics that are associated with mold growth, including age of the building, inadequate ventilation, poor maintenance, such as cracks and leaks in the building infrastructure. Um, and there's a significant amount of research linking mold to a variety of both upper and lower respiratory symptoms in people with and without asthma, and including asthma exacerbations in those who do have asthma. Um, mold thrives in damp places, so any issue that increases moisture in the home can increase mold growth. Moisture can come from outside in. Uh, this can be from damaged windows or leaky roofs without uh, adequate repair. Moisture can also be generated from inside the home. So mold can be an issue in bathrooms or kitchens mainly where moisture is generated if there isn't enough adequate ventilation. It's best, um, next slide. It's best to try to control the indoor environment to prevent mold from developing. And there's guidance published by the EPA for both mold prevention and removal. And I'll um, review the key points. 
So the most important thing uh, to prevent mold is moisture control. Um, moist uh, mold growth can occur fairly quickly, though. So if there is any water damage or leaks in the home, it's important to dry the area within 24 to 48 hours to prevent mold growth. And the EPA also recommends controlling humidity in the home uh, routinely and keeping humidity indoors less than 60% and ideally between 30 and 50%. Um, and this is a running theme throughout our talk, but adequate ventilation is vital. Uh, it's recommended to run exhaust vents or open a window when showering or cooking, uh, since these are the main activities that generate moisture in the home. Um, and there are times that despite best efforts, mold does grow inside the home. And according to the EPA, if the moldy area is less than 10 square feet, you can typically remove it yourself. And mold can be scrubbed off of hard surfaces with detergent and water, although you may need to dispose of absorbent or porous materials such as ceiling tiles or carpeting that can't be adequately cleaned. And it's not enough to just clean the mold, it's just as important to fix the underlying moisture problem. For instance, many times building management will just paint over the mold, uh, but if the underlying problem isn't fixed, the mold's just going to return. Um, so now I'm going to discuss pests, which include both cockroaches and rodents. Um, pest allergens are associated with asthma symptoms and, and are common in urban homes where multi-unit buildings are common, giving pests ad adequate access to plenty of food and water. Um, again, pests include cockroaches and rodents. I'm gonna focus on cockroaches for this talk, but the same mitigation strategies apply to both cockroaches and rodents. So the first time cockroach allergen exposure was linked to asthma morbidity among children was in a publication in the late 90s from the landmark inner city asthma study. And since then exposure to cockroach has been linked to many adverse asthma outcomes, such as increased respiratory symptoms, emergency department visits, hospitalizations, and missed school days. And household cockroach exposure has also been linked uh, to significantly increased risk of developing asthma as well. Um, so this is a picture of the German cockroach, which is the most well-studied type of cockroach and is predominantly the one found in cities. They're attracted to food and water, so they're commonly found in kitchens and, bath kitchens and bathrooms, and they're most active at night uh, foraging for food. So if you do see cockroaches, you likely have an active infestation that needs to be addressed. Um, and it's important to take action to get rid of pest infestations, but you wanna choose the safest method possible. Integrated pest management is a pest mitigation strategy that's preferable to the traditional methods of cockroach extermination with sprays. The EPA definition of integrated pest management or IPM is that it's an environmentally sensitive approach to pest management using means with the least possible hazard to people, property, and the environment. So the key concept of integrated pest management is to reduce the factors that help cockroaches thrive. So to reduce facilitative factors, you wanna decrease the portals of entry. You can do this by sealing cracks and holes in infrastructure, caulking cracks around faucets and pipe fittings. Um, you wanna take away their food and water sources. And this can be achieved by things such as keeping trash always in covered trash bins, making sure dishes are clean right away, that food's not kept out, that certain foods are kept in airtight containers. And cockroaches also like having places to hide. Um, so removing their shelter by uh, removing clutter is also an important uh, key concept of integrated pest management. And sometimes pesticides are necessary. Uh, despite all the preventive action you take. But it's important to pick the safest ones and with the safest delivery method. And bait stations are preferable to sprays. That way it's a smaller amount of pesticide that's contained and that it's not aerosolized. And asthmatics should definitely avoid exposure to pesticide sprays, which can exacerbate their symptoms. All right, so now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about dust mites, which is also a potent allergen. And dust mites are different than dust. They risk refer to these pictured uh, microscopic eight-legged arthropods. Um, it's a very common allergy affecting asthmatics. Up to 62% of children living in cities have been found to be allergic to dust mite on skin testing. Almost all homes have detectable dust mite. Um, they do require moisture and humidity to thrive, so they're less common in the more arid parts of the United States. 
Um, and there are clinical guidelines that have been published in the Annals of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology that provide dust mite mitigation strategies. And I've outlined the main simple steps that are recommended to de decrease exposure to dust mite. So much of the advice focuses on the bedroom. And that's since we spend you know, several hours in our bedroom at one time. Uh, sleeping, but also there are high levels in our beds. And that's because dust mites feed on skin flakes and because um, they are heavy allergens that tend to settle down into bedding, carpeting, and upholstered furniture. The guidelines recommend washing bedding once a week, as well as encasing pillows and mattresses in allergen-proof encasements. Um, regular vacuuming with a HEPA vacuum is helpful in eliminating dust mite allergen and it's typically recommended that carpet is removed from the bedroom if a child does have asthma, if possible. And it's not only dust mites that are found in carpeting, but carpet also acts as a reservoir for other allergens as well. So another key component to dust mite mitigation is controlling humidity. Dust mites thrive in humid conditions, uh, but their survival decreases once humidity falls below 50%. So a hygrometer can be helpful to monitor room humidity. This is a picture of one. They're very inexpensive. They can be found online or in local hardware stores. And if a room is too humid, there are simple steps you can take. You can decrease humidity by using an air conditioner, or if humidity is a significant issue, you may also need to use a dehumidifier dehumidifier as well. Um, there are also chemical methods that are marketed for dust mite avoidance, but the guidelines recommend not using tannic acid or acaricides to remove dust mites. They're not as effective and they also, um, you wanna avoid them because of concerns over chemical exposure. So many studies have shown the benefit to dust mite strategies in reducing asthma symptoms, but a multifaceted approach where many of these approaches are combined is recommended to be most beneficial. So just getting a dust mite pillow cover and mattress cover is not gonna be as effective as incorporating all of these strategies. And the guidelines also recommend a multifaceted approach because many of the same housing conditions that breed dust mites also cause an increased level of other allergens such as mold and cockroach as well. So moving on to pets, pets can be a significant problem for children with asthma if they're allergic. You can have your physician perform a blood test or you can see an allergist uh, for skin testing to see if you or your child is allergic to your pet. Um, and if they are, the best thing is to remove the pet from the home. But I know this can be difficult for families. And um, you at least want to keep the pet out of the asthmatic child's bedroom, clean and vacuum frequently. HEPA fil filters, which I'll talk about next, can be helpful. Uh, but none of these techniques can completely remove all of the pet allergen from your home. If you do find a new home for your pet, it can take several months for the allergen to be removed from the home. And studies have shown that cat allergen can actually persist for up to six months in a home after removal. So a common question we get is regarding HEPA filters. Um, HEPA filters should not be a substitute for reducing pollutants in your home and good ventilation, but they can be a useful component or adjunct to decreasing certain levels of um, allergen pollutants. Um, but not all. HEPA filters don't help significantly with removing dust mite or cockroach allergen because they are heavier, heavier allergens that tend to settle to the ground. Only allergens that are smaller, more airborne can be filtered from your filter. But HEPA filters can be helpful to remove mold spores, pollens, animal dander, and secondhand smoke particles from the air. But it's important you choose a HEPA filter and not an air purifier that emits ozone. Also, proper size of the air filter for a given room and proper maintenance is important for it to be effective. So some research does go into choosing the right one for your room size, and it's important also to change the filters according to manufacturer's instructions. Uh, but there are published guidelines here by the EPA that will share that will help you find the best HEPA, HEPA, air, HEPA filter for your um, size uh, room. So what is the evidence that these inter interventions that we've outlined here actually work to improve health? And there actually is a significant amount of evidence uh, that decreasing exposures to allergens and pollutants can improve asthma outcomes. I'm gonna briefly mention just one of these studies uh, called the Inner City Asthma Study. This was a large multi-city study that included seven sites across the country with almost a thousand um, participants. And there have been many publications associated with the Inner City Asthma Study, but I'm just gonna focus on this one publication um, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine that focused on evaluating asthma outcomes after home-based interventions. 
So some of the families in this study received an intervention that included home visits, asthma education, an environmental remediation plan, and supplies such as dust mite covers, HEPA vacuum, and HEPA air purifiers. And the results show that children who had these interventions had fewer symptom days and the homes had uh, lower levels of dust mite and cockroach. So the inner city asthma study, it's one of the largest and most known study evaluating trigger reduction in asthma outcomes, but there are, have been several subsequent studies also showing that reducing allergens in the home improve um, asthma outcomes as well. And because of this, um, the significant evidence that indoor trigger reduction leads to improved asthma outcomes, these uh, home-based interventions um, and trigger reduction interventions are supported by national guidelines put forth by um, organizations such as the CDC and Department of Health and Human Services. So Dr. Zajac mentioned earlier in our talk, our environmental asthma program. Um, we focus on helping families with children with asthma improve their home environment to reduce exposures to indoor irritants and allergens that we've discussed. We evaluate children with asthma from an environmental health perspective, and we provide asthma education, uh, focus on self-management, as well as asthma trigger reduction. Uh, we also provide our families with asthma kits, that you can see here, including educational materials and asthma action plans, spacers for their inhalers, green cleaning supplies, and microfiber cloths, as well as food containers for cockroach prevention. We're lucky to have excellent community partners, which are listed here. They can provide in-home asthma visits, similar to the ones that were used in the inner city asthma study to help families with allergen mitigation, such as mold removal and integrated pest management strategies, and they can help advocate for the families with building management if needed to get um, help the family get the repairs they need. So I'm going to um, just um, briefly mention these because we're running out of time, uh, but I want we want to leave you with these key messages, which are adequate ventilation is key to decreasing pollutants and having a healthy home. Um, it's important to maintain repairs and dust control and reducing the source of of pollutants as much as possible is important uh, for all families, including um, those with children with asthma. So we'll be providing you via email with key resources um, to supplement this talk, including EPA guidance on indoor air quality, um, as well as information from NiceCheck, including the prescriptions of prevention, um, which we mentioned, as well as um, resources for schools and childcare centers as well. So I'd like to acknowledge our partnering organizations that contribute to the environmental research and public health efforts that are presented as part of this series. And I'd also like to invite you to the next talk in this series where Dr. Perry Sheffield and Dr. Ellen Juss will be talking about air pollution and climate change on May 5th at one o'clock. And now I'll turn things back over to our moderator, Ellen Jane Moss for further discussion. We'll take any questions. Um, uh, thank you both so much. Before we start the q and I would like to invite everyone to get more involved. Volunteer engagement is what enables programs such as this. I joined the board of Exposomic Re Research in Children's Environmental Health at Mount Sinai this past year, and as a child health advocate, it has been incredibly rewarding to learn about the transformational research happening in environmental health and exposomics, as well as the critical work to develop interventions to address environmental exposures, both clinically and through preventative models. We are in the process of seeking new board nominations. So if you or someone you know embraces scientific innovation and wants to be part of this historic effort to transform science and medicine, we want to hear from you. We are looking for individuals who are philanthropically motivated to enact change and help us advance a strategic plan. Additionally, we are forming the children's environmental health community for those who want to be involved at other levels. Please contact us to nominate someone or learn more. Um, the email address, which you can see that is up there, exposome at mssm.edu. Now let's get to your questions. Um, so uh, uh, here's the first one. Companies discuss cleaning vents and such for mold. Some want to test for mold. If you do not see any mold anywhere, is there any real health concern about invisible mold? Great question. Um... I'm happy to start and Dr. Thanik, feel free to, to jump in. Yeah, mold is tricky. Um, usually the case is if you see mold or smell mold or have extensive water damage, then you could assume that mold growth is present 
and should be assessed by um, a professional, like an you know industrial hygienist. You know, testing for mold um, has a lot of limitations, and we actually have. Um, on our nice check website, a document that kind of goes through all of the pros and cons of, of mold testing, because often uh, the results kind of confirm uh, what you may already know uh, by seeing or smelling mold. Where it gets more tricky is if you're concerned about uh, hidden molds and. If, if that is the case, I, the, what I would recommend would be having um, you know, a professional environmental inspector or industrial hygienist assess uh, wall humidity or perhaps if indicated, you know, looking behind the wall um, to determine if there is a mold problem that needs to be remediated. And at the same time, obviously identifying the source of the water exposure, because that needs to be fixed. Do you yeah. have anything else, Dr. Thanet? Yeah. I think the only thing I would add, although we don't recommend typically testing the home, um, if you do have a child with asthma and you're concerned uh, that mold may be contributing to any respiratory symptoms, um, you could have, you can do um, individual testing where with blood testing looking for um, sensitization to a variety of molds or skin testing, which can be done by an allergist. Thank you. Um, There's some questions around um, disinfectant, disinfectants in schools. So since some of these that you've mentioned are not safe for our home, in our, for our homes, um, should schools also avoid these? That is a great question. Um, this has all been at the top of our minds um, since COVID and how do we make sure our schools are safe? Um, you know, recently the CDC and, and other leading agencies have released information that decreases the emphasis on surface dis disinfection and really highlights the importance of good ventilation physical distancing and uh, wearing masks as the keys to reducing spread in schools. And while um, disinfection of high touch surfaces is a, a part of that, um, you know, using large amounts of potentially, you know, irritating chemicals kind of willy nilly is, is not recommended, especially when children are present. And luckily, there's some great groups out there that have been putting together very uh, specific guidelines for how to um, clean and disinfect safely um, during COVID within schools and early child care centers. And so that will be part of the follow up email that you all receive because they have, you know, there's just so much good information, infographics, uh, step by steps um, that we're happy to share with you. But you know, hope uh, one more thing to say, kind of leading off of that, is now that people are paying attention to school environmental health, you know, hoping that once um, the COVID pandemic, you know, hopefully fades away, the focus on ventilation does not fade away because so many asthma triggers, respiratory irritants. Um, can be found in school air. And so hopefully this puts a lens on the importance of school ventilation systems, um, that they're working, um, that they're functioning you know, optimally, and that will have long-term health benefits even after uh, COVID is over. Um, there are a couple of questions just generally around the effects of air fresheners, fragrances, essential oils, um, and have these been studied as being potential irritants? I feel like you addressed some of this in your presentation. Yeah, any strong odors um, and anything, any chemicals, uh, scents that are aerosolized into the air can be an irritant for children with asthma, and we do advise against them. Okay. Um, uh, it, uh, one question is wondering what the best way is to clean ventilation ducts contam contaminated with high mold spore counts. 
that's a that's a really good question and actually we've had families in the past contact our center with those questions and we were able to reach out to colleagues with uh, who are industrial hygienists and who have that experience and it really you have to kind of weigh the issue very carefully because the act of cleaning the ducts especially if not done carefully can actually increase the spread of pollutants throughout the ventilation system in the home and so i would say if that's something that you're considering to make sure you speak to a reputable um, industrial hygiene professional about that and whether it's really needed. Thank you. Um, so we've talked a lot about ventilation to reduce the spread of coronavirus. Um, when we are past COVID, what should be our goal in terms of continuing to monitor and, monitor and improve ventilations in schools, buildings, and even our homes? Um, well, for schools, um, you know, what we've been learning <laughs> during COVID is as they were assessing the ventilation system of schools here in New York City, but all over the country, is that they were old, they were not working. Um, schools that relied on windows for ventilation, the windows wouldn't open. I mean, they so many problems have been identified. and. There needs to be investment in a solution moving forward because that's where kids spend large part of, of their days. The EPA has a program called Tools for Schools and we'll include it in the resources that we send out. Tools for Schools pro provides evidence-based guidelines for schools to optimize indoor air quality with a big focus on HVAC systems and ventilation. You know, unfortunately, this is not an enforceable program. It's not required of schools. It's just recommended. And, you know, on a personal level, um, I, you know, in terms of thinking about where to focus advocacy, you know, having a child, I have a young child in the school system now is how do we get decision makers to invest money so that schools can carry out these programs in the long term to ensure that ventilation um, is optimal. Um, how do patients with environmental concerns access your clinic to have their children evaluated? So we'll provide you with a follow-up email with a link for an email uh, to the Pass you as well as a number where our clinic can be reached uh, so to um, to make appointments for your patient for your children. Um, I think we'll wrap with this one. As leaders in ch children's environmental health, how would you characterize the field's evolution, and what are you most excited about today? Um, I think I'll start. I think. Children's environmental health has primarily been a research and public health field, um, but I'm excited about efforts to apply these really important research findings into clinical care. Um, for this to be done, there needs to be more education of clinicians regarding environmental health research findings. And also there needs to be an effort for insurance payers to reimburse uh, for these clinical services. And many organizations are uh, making pu push towards both of these efforts. Great. Well, thanks everyone. Our next talk will be in two weeks on May 5th with Dr. Perry Sheffield and Dr. Alan Just, who will discuss air pollution and climate change. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>